Lady bill number 112 by Senator Clater. It is an act <clears throat> to amend the Constitution relative to capital punishment. Senator Clater. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members. We don't uh, talk about life and death down here too often, but here we are talking about the death penalty. In committee, I, I ask people, what does your bill do and why do we need it? This bill is pretty simple. If you look at it, it says, no law shall subject any person to the death penalty as punishment for any offense committed on or after January 1, 2021. And as far as the language that would be put on the ballot, it says, do you support an amendment to abolish the death penalty as punishment for any offense committed on or after January 1, 2021? The election on this would be November 3rd, 2020. That would be the presidential election next year, where you would have the maximum turnout. Um, folks ask me, why would you bring a bill like this? Where was the impetus for that? How did you come up with this? I, went, I was invited by St. Aloysius to come visit with their um, catechism class on a Sunday afternoon. And it was 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th graders, maybe some a little bit older and some a little bit younger. But one young lady put her hand up and asked me the question. She said, Senator Clater, how does your faith collide with your, with your job as a senator? And how do you reconcile being pro-life, being pro-life, and at the same time being for the death penalty? Uh, I, I fumbled for an answer and spoke to these children, and, and they could see some uh, incongruencies in that. And I left there, and I, I started thinking about it. And the more I thought about it, the more I was convinced that the death penalty doesn't work as a deterrent, that the cost of the program is too much, that life in prison was potentially much worse than the death penalty, that we do make mistakes and that the application and results are not reliable, that uh, it's a morally wrong thing to do, and at the end of the day, it cheapens life. And by this cheapening of life, I think we contribute to a, an atmosphere that just brings us further and further down. So I see I have some questions. I'll do my best to answer these questions. A yield of questions? Yes, sir. All right, Senator Long. Thank you, Senator Clater. Uh, talk with me a little bit, not that we need to follow any other examples, but what is trending in the United States as far as other states when it comes to this issue? So in the United States, uh, of the 50, 30 have the death penalty, 20 do not have the death penalty, uh, 4 have a moratorium. So you could almost say that we're equally divided on this issue. Just how did we get divided with the gu gubernatorial moratoriums? But for Louisiana, I often say we, we do have the highest homicide rate in the country. So how has the death penalty helped our situation, and, and it does not appear to have helped our situation. Other states that don't have the death penalty that look like us would be Illinois, Maryland, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, and I think Illinois is probably the best one as far as how would it compare to us, and they have a lower homicide rate than we do, but it's, to me, that's certainly very important. And does it act as a deterrent or not? And I would say that it doesn't when you look across the country that it doesn't act as a deterrent. But um, it's tr we're trending away from the death penalty. Talk to me a bit about the last time uh, the death penalty has been imposed in Louisiana. So the last time that the death penalty was imposed in Louisiana, 
There was a child murderer that was given the death penalty. His name was Gerald Bordelon. And uh, his crime was a terrible crime. And anybody that gets exposed to first degree murder has committed some terrible crime, either by the act being combined with the murder or the quality of the person being murdered. Is it a uh, child or an old person? Those are the things that trigger whether or not you look at that. Gerald Bordelon was a sex offender and murdered a child. Um, over the last 12 years, we've spent more than, I had a, a handout given to you that basically says we've spent more than $200 million on this program and we've had one volunteer. Bordelon didn't fight on the appeal and accepted the punishment, I say in part because life in prison was more of a punishment than taking you out and calling it a day. So as far as the effectiveness of a program where we would look at any other program here, it's a $200 million plus program with one volunteer to show for it. So it is not a program that we would say is working very well. So uh, um, I think I missed, uh, what was the last year that we had the death penalty imposed? I, I can't answer it off the top of my head, but more than 10 years. So, so it's safe to say it is not something that is imposed that we read about or that we see happening on a regular basis. I, I, th I think the point I'm making is that the death penalty is extremely rare in Louisiana. My last question, Senator, can you walk me through the appeal process when someone is on death row? Because it seems like uh, our legal system provides a number of checks and balances. Can you address that? So when there's a death penalty, there's a direct appeal to the Louisiana Supreme Court that we believe that it's that important that we have the scrutiny there. But before you ever get to the appellate side, you have people that are appointed or retained. If somebody's got enough money to retain a lawyer, that, that's one thing. But the truth of the matter is the way that this penalty is applied, it's predominantly poor people that end up on the uh, losing end of a death penalty, and it's predominantly uh, African-American people uh, as far as the way that it's applied. So really, uh, in all practical matters, you got to look at who's appointed. As far as when someone is appointed, they have to be death penalty qualified. The American Bar Association requires that you meet certain standards as far as the training. So you get highly qualified lawyers along with highly qualified support staff, along with highly, highly qualified mitigation experts that are able to tell people about the the background of the person that is an accused then if the death penalty comes back and it has to be unanimous and that was the only thing that we had unanimous jury verdicts on that weren't uh, six-person juries but in Louisiana we've had uh, that you have to have a unanimous jury so once that verdict comes back then it's on an automatic appeal to the Louisiana Supreme Court but you know, as a practical matter, it doesn't stop there. If there are constitutional deficiencies, even if the Louisiana Supreme Court says, yes, that was done properly and fairly, and it was a fair trial, and the punishment ought to be carried out, then prisoners make appeals to the, through the habeas corpus process that p potentially takes you all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. So um, if your point is that there are judicial safeguards, they're there. The problem is, is that we have a high exoneration rate where there's a high uh, turnover. Some people use the word exoneration as synonymous for not guilty. Uh, I won't try to tell you that that's the case. Uh, but exoneration just means that it's reversed. And we have an exceptionally high exoneration rate because this is a system of man and people. It's, we're not infallible. We make mistakes. And we put uh, the, the safeguards in place for this, but we still end up having uh, matters that are reversed. So, so in every trial, every death penalty trial, uh, that jury is selected by whom? 
I'm assuming that both sides of the argument, both those who are representing the state as well as those who are representing the defendant, how are these 12 jurors selected? To be selected as a juror, you actually have to be what we call death penalty qualified. So if you do not believe in the death penalty, you cannot sit on the jury. We only have people that say, yes, I believe in the death penalty and I believe that I can do it if the state proves their case. And so you do eliminate a whole class of people, which are those that do not believe in the death penalty, but the defendant and the state take part in the selection of the jury, but you cannot serve on the jury if you're not death penalty qualified. Uh, my last question, are there any crimes in your mind that are uh, horrendous enough that rise to the level that the public is, is better served with the option of the death penalty being available? I have friends on both sides of this issue, and uh, they're going to be friends of mine tomorrow, just like they are today and like they were yesterday. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was a prosecutor once upon a time. I participated in the process. I never took a death penalty case from beginning to end. But I was a real believer in the death penalty, and it's easy to come up and say, Somebody walks into a schoolyard and kills 10 children. Why shouldn't they get the death penalty? It's hard to say that it is my belief that that cheapens the entire system and that they should not uh, get the death penalty. I've had a conversion as we've gone along and through this process. And I know that one day you and I will be out of here and I'll be dead and I'll be having to answer for my conduct in this place and I will have the question posed to me in my mind, you had an opportunity to do something about this, and yet you didn't do a thing. So uh, that's important to me. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions? All right. Senator Morrell, you wish the floor? Senator Morrell, you wish the floor on the bill? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mr. President, members. I'll be exceedingly brief. I made a comment in committee. I thought it was very on point, so I want to make sure I say it today. Um, when it comes to the death penalty, I think that one thing we have to keep in consideration when you're talking about death being on the table is that it is a simple, undisputed fact in this state that we have had individuals who were on death row who have been exonerated and are, were proven later to be innocent. And by the advent of technology and other developments, people were recanting testimony. Those individuals who were on death row were proven to be innocent and taken off. Uh, I think that in order for the death penalty to ever be appropriate, especially for those of you like myself who don't believe that government is the end all be all, is that government, in order to have death on the table, has to be infallible because death is permanent. And if you believe the death penalty is appropriate, I think part of the argument has to be that you believe the government can't or will not ever get it wrong, because if they get it wrong, you can't unkill somebody. They're just dead. If we start from the position that government is fallible, government makes mistakes, we all acknowledge that. I mean, we literally spend, we spent years in this body in the legislature correcting our own mistakes occasionally then it's hard if you start with the point that government can, can make mistakes that you'd ever empower government to kill someone. Now, all that being said, all Senator Clater is doing is allowing our constituents to determine whether they have the faith in government to carry out the death penalty. What we're voting on today is not whether or not to allow the death penalty in Louisiana. It's simply to allow our constituents to determine do they have the faith in government to do so. And that's an open-ended question. We don't know today what our constituents will or will not do. But I would simply encourage you to support Senator Clayton's bill today to let our constituents let their voice be heard. Because if they determine they have that much faith in government, at that point, I think that that's something that's taken into consideration going forward. Thank you.
Uh, you have a question, Senator Clayton? You want to ask him a question? Sure. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Morrell, what is your understanding as it relates to how the death penalty is applied as far as what socioeconomic groups or ethnic groups is it predominantly applied to? Uh, the last numbers I saw is that in the state of Louisiana, you are significantly, and by significantly I mean by a five or ten times multiplier, more likely to be given the death penalty as an African American. Uh, when it comes to when an African American is perpetrated a crime against a non-African American, that number goes up. Um, when an African American perpetuates a crime against another African American, that number goes down. But the metrics have shown consistently that if you are an African American person in the state of Louisiana committing the same crime as a non-African American, you are significantly more likely to get the death penalty and it's free put on the table. The other issue is, as you know, with application, something that I found increasingly troubling is that there are many families of victims that in their faith do not believe the death penalty is appropriate. And oftentimes, prosecutors will discount the victim's family's wishes in pursuing the death penalty. Uh, something that I've seen frequently, especially in the city of New Orleans, is you will literally have the victim's families at the penalty phase saying, please don't give this individual the death penalty. And I would, I would argue that that is a reality that kind of goes to the fact that the application of it is kind of troublesome. Uh, lastly, as far as the application side, um, the last time that the death penalty was applied to a Caucasian for the killing of an African person, uh, were we not Fritch citizens at that time? I don't have those numbers in front of me. That would not surprise me. <laughs> that would not surprise me, but I don't have those numbers in front of me. Thank you. Any further discussion? Further discussion, Senator Chabin? All right, okay. Just checking with you. All right. Senator Clady, have a right to close. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a difficult issue for us that we grapple with and that we, we like to think that we're pro-life and that we're consistent in it. Uh, I uh, think of and had a discussion where the Pharisees were trying to trip Jesus up and they, I am preaching a little bit, Francis, and uh, the question was about whether or not we are bound by secular law or are we bound by uh, God's law. And they were posing this question to Jesus and he said, give me one of your coins. And he took the coin and he looked at it and he said, whose picture is on here? And uh, they said, Caesar. And he said, well, give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar's. Give unto my father what belongs to him. I say that our father gave us life and that it is not for us to take it from those that he gave it to. We could get into a big, long discussion about it, but that's the way. I view it, and that's my preaching on that point, Francis, and I think it's important. But from a fiscal point of view, $200 million program, you get one result. As a deterrent, we have the highest homicide rate in the country, not a deterrent. Those that don't have the death penalty have a smaller uh, homicide rate. And at the end, is it morally wrong or not, and does it cheapen life in our country? I think that we ought to allow the voters to weigh in on this issue, and I would ask that you vote with me to allow the voters to make a decision on this. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I ask that you move favorable. Senator Clayton, now moves final passage of the bill. When the machines are open, those in favor will vote yes, those opposed no. Secretary, open the change, please. Vote your machines, please. Votes machines. You through voting? And Martini, no. You through voting? All right, close them up, please. The gentleman desired to give notice of reconsideration. Before he did, the vote was 13 yeas and 25 nays.